Okay. All right. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, and we'll start off opening reading by Roger. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I think it's always helpful to start um, meetings at congregations with some gratitude. And so I'm going to share a reading from Reverend Laura Hort Horton uh, Ludwig about having a generous heart. For what shall we give thanks? For this moment, for friends near and far, for our breath, for love, for courage and clarity, for strength, for delight, for laughter, for beauty. For the tables round which we gather, for the food we enjoy with friends seasoned with love and memory. Parenthetically, some of that last part is memory right now for most of us. For the sun and moon and stars in the sky, for the trees who have seen so much and still sit, stand proud, stretching themselves to the sky, for the bright voices of children, for the wisdom of elders, for actions that bless the world, for hard work that makes a difference, for music and art and celebration, for generosity, for compassion, for endurance, for joy, for hope. For all these things, we give thanks. Thank you, Roger. All right, uh, we can move forward a couple slides and just do a quick review of the agenda. Um, all right, um, so welcome again to our virtual Zoom parish meeting. And uh, we have um, uh, quite a few things on the agenda, actually. Um, just one vote. We will, uh, in a minute, we will um, approve the minutes from the last parish meeting. So we haven't, if you, if, if you would like to uh, review those and you haven't yet, um, the link to the meeting materials is on the website. Um, next, so after that, we have uh, um, a few quick updates. We have some updates on nominations and uh, future bylaws updates and, um, and a quick update um, from the search committee. It's a very busy time for the search committee and Dorit will fill us in on, um, on their work so far. Um, then the next topic is um, Reverend Roger will introduce the concept of a relational covenant, um, some work that's going to be going on later this year. Uh, then we'll hear from the leadership team of um, Kelly, Roger, and Monica uh, with an update on our strategic priorities for the year. Um, then we have um, Tim Conroy, chair of the personnel committee, along with Roger, um, who will talk about staff compensation. And we will close um, with some continuing discussion on our open question of what it would look like for FUS to center people of color. And President-elect Alyssa Ryan Joy will lead this discussion. All right, so again, the, the handouts. Um, there is a link in the chat, link on the website. Uh, we have the minutes and then a document to accompany the uh, relational covenant um, introduction. And then the, um, there's a leadership team report um, that's, um, it will be, you know, we we're speaking to that as well, but if you'd like to look at those, those are available. Okay, um, so just to review again, um, the, you, we've had some rules of procedure. If we can move to the, to the next slide. Um, with our Zoom format, we are trying to conduct business as closely as possible as we would in person. And uh, we will use the Zoom functionality, uh, the poll functionality um, to, to hold our votes. And uh, so all the same, um, you know, all the same processes as in an in-person meeting, um, we've established quorum. And uh, when we do vote, um, you know, vote only if eligible, um, as we normally would. And we do have at least one person um, voting by phone. So we will pause for a voice vote for, um, for those folks as well. All right. 
Um, so the only uh, the only item that we have that requires a vote for today is accepting our uh, minutes from the last parish meeting. Um, so the board moves to um, to accept these minutes. Um, so we'll just open up the floor if anyone has any um, any questions or corrections to those minutes. And feel free to use the chat if anyone uh, if anyone has a question. And we have on the screen, we're also, it's, it's yet another chance to practice uh, voting here. We, um, uh, you know, Monica has made some uh, updates to the format of the, uh, of the poll question that hopefully clarify a little bit better how to vote if there are two people, um, two voting members sharing the same machine to, uh, to join the Zoom meeting. So they're the same question. So each person only needs to answer the question once. And it, they, so there are um, it, the same the same question is posed several times to allow for multiple people to answer the same poll. So if you're the only person, so you make your selection. And then if you're the only person voting for the other options, you can just select I'm the only person at my house voting. So any questions on, um, any questions, comments, additions to the, oh, uh, question about explaining the poll function. Um, so it, it, as soon as we've closed discussion, the poll will pop up on your screen. And all you have to do is answer the questions by selecting your response. And you will have to, um, you know, select the I'm the only person if, uh, you know, once you once everyone has has voted and once you click submit, um, that poll will just disappear and it will go back to the normal normal screen. All right. There aren't any other questions. Um, I, Monica, I think we can move to voting. Give it a little more time. We've got um, still waiting for about 40% to respond. for number two and number three, I am the only person voting in my house, and then you'll be able to submit. Not seeing any options here. I just see the motion. I think that was Jim. Jim, do you see the motion? And then it says, number one, I'm in favor, and there's a yay, a nay, and abstain. No. Just the motion. Why don't we take your vote verbally if, or in the chat, if that's okay. And there's three questions, y'all. 
my screen only showed two. I had to scroll down for three mm -hmm. for the submit button to work. And the, seeing and, any and scrolling and here. Here, there are three questions, and two and three are repetitive. We'll go all three. And it will be a separate window. So there's the there's the main meeting window, and then the poll pops up on the screen. So it could be minimized, possibly. That's However, right. you have to you have to vote for all three of, on all three of those poll questions. So we have now submitted three yay votes rather than two because that it was the only way it would allow us to submit. You should be able to select. Um, you should be able to select. I'm the only person voting in my house for the for questions two and three. If if you're if you're the only person voting. But what if you're two people? That's the question. We're two yeah. people. If you're two people, um, first person votes on question one, second person votes on question two, and then for question three, you put I'm the only person voting in my house. Thank you. Or I'm, <laughs> which is, I'm the only person, or there are two people voting in my house. I still, oh, excuse me, I still have a frozen screen in front of me. I just see the motion. Please select I am the only person on question two or three. I wonder if it's related to machine. I wonder if it's mm -hmm. on iPad, iPad and the same thing, Jim. I also voted, but I'm still on the page where it says motion and please select. I'm the only person voting, but mm -hmm. I thought I did it. That's but just the, the slide that you all are seeing. That was just the instruction slide saying what the motion was. But the, if you if you clicked on the poll and put it through, then that went through for you. But then how do we get to the next page? What was that, Sarah? How do, you to, how do you get to the next page after you vote you voted and it comes back and said it's motion approval of minutes? Well we'll move we'll move to the next page when the next agenda we're moving. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, I think I think we probably have enough to meet the quorum, but we can. Uh, is anyone still? Uh, no, we, do, we do. We do want people to understand the polling function just for for practice. <laughs> so, uh, is anyone still struggling? Um, yes. Still Let me. Uh, at first screen. On an iPad, on the very top of your screen is poll in progress, and if you hit that, it takes you to where you can vote. If you have an iPad, to very top. top. Mm. Don't have an iPad. Oh, never mind. On other devices, it may be at the bottom too. So mm -hmm. The word "full in progress." Full in progress. And if you hover the mouse, if you're at a computer with a mouse, sometimes if you hover the mouse toward the bottom of the screen, that's where the additional options will appear. Yes. Is there anything that says "poll polling in progress"? No. Mm hmm. Jim, you may have to fill around with your view to get to minimize the motion sign and then you may be able to see the poll. Uh, Did he send a direct message to one of you? You could also just vote in the chat. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah, so let's let's move on for now. We do have um, enough uh, votes in the affirmative here. Um, I think we've, we've accepted the minutes um, and we, we will come back to this to try and make this as clear as possible for future votes. Um, so this was, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep getting better at this. Um, all right, so I think we, you know, the motion passes. All right. All right, um, so I just wanted to share um, a couple updates um, on, uh, on work of the committees of the board. Um, we do have an open position on the board that the nominations committee is actively working to fill. 
So if anyone has names to suggest, or if you're interested in finding out any more about board service, you can contact our nominations committee chair, Joe Kramer, at fusnominations at gmail.com. And that's right there on the screen. Um, also, our governance committee, um, during the ministerial transition, uh, the board and the governance committee has been um, looking at refining the language in the minister's section of the bylaws. Um, the proposed changes include clarifying the difference between a hired minister and a called minister, and also specifying the percentage vote required for decisions related to called ministry. Uh, so the board will offer, offer an opportunity to review this in detail before bringing forward for a congregational vote. Um, so look for more soon on that topic. All right, so I think we have uh, Dorrit up next to provide an update on the search committee. Okay. Hi, everybody. It's um, great to be here representing the other six people, the seven of us on the search team, and we have indeed been busy. Uh, just a brief recap. So in September, we conducted the congregational survey. And in October, we conducted um, focus groups and uh, cottage meetings. We also had a beyond categorical thinking workshop. In November, the team took all of that information and a lot of other information about First Unitarian Society and wrote our congregational record. Beginning of December, interested ministers were able to look at the records of all congregations in our denomination in search. And at the beginning of January, we were able to look at the records, ministerial records of anyone who was interested in First Unitarian Society. So the update from the beginning of January is that we received 13, we received 13 ministerial records um, in January. And from that, we ended up conducting eight one hour Zoom interviews. Currently, as of um, today, we are in what's called the pre-candidating phase. After those eight interviews, we identified three people that we wanted to have a long weekend with, um, all by Zoom. Um, we've completed one of those, and we have still two to come. We also wanted to report to you about Reverend Kelly's involvement in the search process. Um, we settled on with Reverend Kelly and with Re Reverend uh, Roger talking about it. Uh, Reverend Kelly has an extended one-on-one -on -one conversation with each candidate. She also joins us for an informal social time we have at the beginning of that weekend. After the pre-candidating weekends are over, she will meet with us to share her impressions before the team goes on to its final discernment process. And that's our update. Thank you, Nora. All right, uh, next up, um, Roger is going to introduce the um, idea of a relational covenant. All right, thank you. thanks, Terry. Um, so thank you, thank you, Dort, for that report too, that um, the search committee here is just amazing and I feel really privileged to get to work with them this year. Uh, so I just wanna lift up the really good work that they're doing and that they also are having fun together even after these months of intensive work so that's pretty cool too um, so i want to talk about a relational covenant and there is a document that um that is a summary and i'm going to highlight a few things from that and also give an example so a relational covenant is a written articulation of how members affiliates staff of a congregation aspire to interact with one another. It's not a set of rigid rules, but are guidelines intended particularly for individual and group self-reflection. Um, I know that FUS has a safe congregation policy, and that is different from this in that a safe congregation policy, uh, policy especially really does have rules. You know, for example, um, it's, it's, 
it's required that there never be a case where there's one adult with children or youth in FUS programming. There always needs to be two. And that, that's not a guideline, that's a requirement. Um, this, the relational covenant is more about uh, more subtle um, ways that we interact with each other. For example, uh, a relational covenant often encourages, invites people to directly communicate with each other when they have a concern or an issue. So um, congregations that create these are more likely to interact thoughtfully and intentionally with one another, especially in areas of disagreement. And over time, these relational covenants can really shift a congregation to uh, a healthier place in, term, in terms of their interpersonal dynamics. So an example, uh, from my ministry in Appleton, we had one of these that we adopted around 2003. And uh, well into, you know, years, years after adoption, um, there was a change that, that I and the other minister made in the worship life of the congregation, which was not universally loved. Um, in fact, there were two people who really hated it. And the relational covenant directed them to share with the ministers. We had really good conversations about it. Um, our, we had a healthy congregation team that really made the behavioral covenant or the relational covenant a live thing. They worked with these two folks um, to sort of discern, you know, how big of a deal was this for them? One of them discerned uh, with, that, with that conversation and conversation with me and the other minister that it was, um, you know, it was not that big of a deal. Um, this person, the day I left, still said, I think you were wrong on that, but, you know, stayed in there. Um, and the other person discerned that it was a deal breaker for her. And so she um, made the decision to leave the congregation. I was sorry about that. Um, I think she was sorry that that's, that's the way things went. But we had had a good conversation, kept the channels open, listened to each other, um, and so when she made that decision, the door was still open. In fact, um, while not a member, she would, you know, frequently come and, and participate and found her own way through that. So it felt like to me that relational covenant really helped us all navigate a disagreement. So this is all why a lot of UU congregations these days have these relational covenants. Um, they're encouraged and resourced. Um, in creating them by the UUA. And the widening the circle report from the UUA's commission on, um, stru on systemic structural change that I've referred to a lot this year and that I'll, the board's been reading and the racial justice learning circle have been reading um, encourages these, they really help in community. I wanted to make clear and in the document, we you know do this as well that um, this does not replace the bond of union, which was adopted by the congregation at its founding in 1879. That's really a beautiful statement. Um, you, it's, it's up in the landmark auditorium uh, as a reminder. And it stood the test of time. It was updated um, for inclusive language around 1980. Uh, what this relational covenant would do is build on that platform be a little more specific, but but uh, be be an addition, really, an additional way of understanding, relating with each other. So the Board of Trustees approved a plan for a, a small team to work on this project with the goal of presenting um, for congregational vote in June, a relational covenant, a draft covenant. And the process will include several opportunities for congregational input. It's really important that this relational covenant um, reflect the, the thoughts and feelings of FUS members uh, so that it's, uh, it's something that, that people really buy into. Um, so that's kind of the process. If it turns out it takes longer, it takes longer, that's fine. But the goal would be to have something in place by early June. Uh, so that's, that's the process. And I would invite questions and it may work Best. We, we have a minute or two before Terry says we need to move on. Um, you might work best if you put your question in the chat, if that works for you. Yeah, I think we do have time for questions. 
who is on that committee and how will that be formed? Thanks, Lori. So the committee will be appointed by the Board of Trustees and report to the Board of Trustees. And uh, the board is working on assembling who's on that committee. It will include me and at least one board member. If you have an interest in that, uh, you're certainly welcome to contact me or Terry. Um, and we'll probably get that going in the next week or two. And I'm not seeing other questions in the chat. So. All right. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Roger. Okay. And uh, the leadership team, leadership team is the next topic. All right. Everyone can hear me all right? All right, so we, um, we are trying something a little bit new in the meeting material packet. Uh, I hope you all get a chance to take a look at that after this meeting if you haven't already. So each month, the staff leadership team shares with the Board of Trustees a written report that calls out some of the programmatic or operational highlights, uh, especially those that are focused on the progress around this year's strategic priorities. Um, and we thought we would do the same for you. So Kelly is gonna mention just a few of the programmatic elements that are highlighted there. Uh, but first, you'll notice that year-to-date financial highlights are also included. So um, you'll be able to read about those in greater length in the March edition of the Madison Unitarian. And uh, hopefully many of you also recall the lengthier update at December's parish meeting on financials and are looking forward to a very thorough overview on our uh, financial landscape at uh, the Financial Forum on May 23rd. But in the meantime, today, I'll share just three um, things very quickly. Uh, the first which is that $196,000 that we received from the Paycheck Protection Program, um, that was fully forgiven in January. Great, don't need. And second, uh, just weeks ago, we were approved for an additional PPP loan of $207,000, which uh, we also remain optimistic will be fully forgiven. Um, and that would bring our total additional income to just over $400,000. And third, the not so hot news is that our pledge income to date is currently below about $144,000 below our parish approved budget from last May. Um, so, of course, the PPP funds will be really useful in helping us address um, projected end of year deficit. Uh, and as we prepare for the very exciting kickoff of next year's stewardship campaign in March, we'd ask that you all please um, give as generously as you're able. Um, we can um, hopefully set, us our, set ourselves up to fully fund and support next year's programming and a very exciting new ministry team that we have ahead of us. Um, so with that, uh, let's hear from Kelly on some of the wonderful programming that we're doing this year. Kelly. All right, thank you. And you may see that Terry just put in the chat that if you're not speaking, if you could turn off your video for a minute and we're gonna see if we can help Monica's internet connection. Monica, you were freezing just a little bit, but I think everyone, um, heard you and um, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and I can try to answer from what Monica just shared. Uh, so my piece of this is to um, let you know a little bit of the highlights that we've been doing programmatically with these initiatives. The first one being nurturing a strong sense of community through the pandemic, taking care of ourselves and one another with love. Um, and so a couple things that you uh, may or may not know, um, we wanted to highlight that the worship team and our worship tech team have been working to improve the quality of the worship experience on YouTube. And we hope that you have noticed uh, some new cameras and um, seeing how uh, a difference that that can make. 
Um, we've also been, you know, really keeping in the forefront the differences in worship that you all are watching on a screen instead of being with us in, per in person. And so we're trying to make changes and adaptations for that. Um, there's a member Facebook group, uh, which uh, our communications director, Brittany Crawford, began. It's fostering connections between members with intentional posts from both member administrators and staff. Uh, yesterday was National Pet Day. So there was a post and thank you to Dorit Bergen for posting about her beautiful little chihuahuas. Um, so it is just another sweet place of connection for folks. And then we've been making connections in a couple different ways. Lay ministers have been connecting with our elders as well as some of our children's RE classes have been um, sending cards and making cards and sending those out. I hope all of you received the postcard from a lay ministry around the solstice, reminding you how you can get in touch with lay ministers if that would support you at this time. Um, and under dismantling systems of oppression and particularly racism, uh, a couple things to highlight that there are 21 FUS members who are currently taking the Black History for a New Day course from Nehemiah and Justified Anger. They're taking that together in two FUS cohorts. And one of the lovely pieces, we know that we have other members who are currently taking it on their own with Nehemiah. The special piece about taking it together at FUS is that there are some questions that are for specifically for congregations. And so we'll be really interested to see um, what those folks have learned and their thoughts on, on what we can do as a congregation when that course is over. But thank you to everyone and, and thank you to our facilitation team of Marilee Wirtlake and Sue Haug and Susan Koenig and Becky Burns and Lori Schwartz. So a special shout out to them for making this um, Black History for a New Day FUS cohort possible. And then we hope that you all enjoyed um, Zister Alex Capitan from the Transforming Hearts Collective. Um, Alex was with us to do both a um, the service and also a workshop after. And um, that Wartman that Wartman series is is a gift to our community. So thanks to Bill still for setting that up. Um, and then we do have our racial justice learning circle. And we just spent three sessions looking at widening the circle, which is the report from the institution, the Commission on Institutional Change from the Unitarian Universalist Association. You can find widening the circle as a free PDF on the UUA's website if you haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, and that racial justice circle continues in April. They meet once a month. Information is on the website and in the red floors, and we'd love to have everybody join us. Um, and then our final, um, the strategic initiative about practicing adaptability and supporting our search team. Again, just a thank you and a shout out to the incredible search team that we have here. I have been hearing from colleagues that interact with our search team uh, just how wonderful um, that our group and strong and respectful and just committed to this process they are. Um, so the board held two sessions on the new uh, ministry model, one on their own and then one with Reverend John Cresswell when he was both here for worship and then again, and then uh, candidating week, April 25th through May 2nd. So please mark your calendars. That's gonna be a really uh, special week for us here. So thank you. So those are just some of the highlights and just to give you a flavor of the kinds of things programmatically that the leadership team is sending to the board. You know, please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you, Kelly. Um, and there's a um, uh, longer report as, as well. Um, I've mentioned a number of times how much we appreciate the new format. Um, so that uh, the leadership team report is a similar um, similar format to what the board has been receiving every month. And it's a really nice, uh, uh, clear connection between the strategic priorities and the various um, programming activities um, going on. So Tim and Roger, um, 
onto the staff compensation topic. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Conroy. I'm the chair of the personnel committee. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'll be uh, going through some talking points about what we're we'll be talking about in the personnel committee, and um, and Roger will be here as well to help uh, answer some different questions that that you may have as we go. If we want to um, kind of save some of those to the end, that would be that would be ideal. So first off, um, FUS Board of Trustees and its personnel committee have committed the congregation to taking a thoughtful and systematic approach to compensation, keeping the values of equity, economic justice, and integrity at the heart of our deliberations. FUS's leadership adopted the Unitarian Universalist Association compensation guidelines, which are adjusted geographically according to per capita income as a benchmark. So here's where we are currently. Although the congregation has expressed a desire and made some attempts over the last 15 years to get fair compensation for all employees, the leadership team assesses that eight of our 17 staff are paid below the UUA minimum for their positions. This includes associated costs such as payroll taxes. It would, it would require $63,000 additionally every year to bring staff to at least the minimum. Taking into account the length of service, 13 staff members are paid below their recommended compensation amount. That would require an additional $114,000 annually to bring all staff to recommendations. So FUS can make significant progress toward compensating our staff fairly in a few ways. One is increasing revenue, two is cutting expenses, or three is a combination of both. FUS's budget's quite bare bones when it comes to programming and building up keep, so cutting expenses enough to make progress and fair compensation would necessitate shrinking the staff size. I should note, FUS has already, over the past eight years, significantly shrunk its staff. So we feel that it's time to wrestle with this dilemma. Our preferred mode to address it is through increasing revenue. Um, absent increased revenue, we will have a choice. To serve our mission and speak to our UU values to have more staff paid wages in that many cases lack equity and fairness, or should we move to having fewer staff who are fairly paid? We will broaden this discussion beyond FUS leadership this winter and spring, beginning with the presentation of these points today at this meeting, a listening session with staff on March 10th, and a Zoom listening session for the congregation on March 14th. We will continue to explore this issue as our revenue picture for the 2021-2022 year becomes clearer with our annual stewardship drive. A successful drive makes this conversation a lot easier. We anticipate that this conversation, as well as the stewardship drive results, will have an impact on the proposed 21-22 budget and 22-23 budget. We all have unique and important role to play in this. We hope FUS member affiliates will first and foremost submit their 2021 and 2022 pledges as quickly as possible in March, and that everyone will strive to be as generous as possible. Now we understand that the pandemic induced economic downturn has impacted some folks financially, and those folks cannot increase their bid, uh, their pledges and may need to cut them. We also know that many people in FUS have not been adversely impacted by the downturn and continued and increased generosity from these folks will help immensely. Second, FUS members and affiliates can engage in the listening session on March 14th. The process of creating the 21-22 budget and other opportunities for congregational input. So please speak up. Staff will engage by participating in the staff listening session and more broadly, by continuing to be good stewards of the congregation's generosity. So if the increase in revenue doesn't pan out as we wish, what happens? Who makes those decisions? After engaging with the congregation, the Board of Trustees will ultimately make the decision about whether to prioritize a larger staff that is not compensated across the board in accordance with UUA guidelines or a smaller staff that is fairly compensated. The leadership team, the ministers and executive director working with the personnel committee and the finance committee will follow the board directive in creating the proposed budget for 21-22 and 22-23. 
the board and then the congregation will act on the proposed budgets in June 2021 and June 2022. So if you have questions, uh, now you can ask me uh, now, um, as well as board member Lorna Aronson or any member of FUS's leadership team, uh, Reverend Kelly, Reverend Roger, and Executive Director Monica. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. So if there are um, questions, you can put them in um, in chat now. And the listening session coming up also. I know that was a lot to take in uh, verbally, so uh, there there will be a listening session as well in, uh, was it March 14th? What, March, March 14th. All right. Um, not thank you very much. I'm not not seeing anything come in in chat right now. Okay. Um, hey Terry, uh, one just oh. in. Okay. Yeah, I can speak to that that one from uh, Paul and Carol. Has you has FUS ever looked at the UA compensation guidelines to see if we agree they are appropriate for FUS, given all the factors that go into compensation? Um, that's a continuing focus, um, especially for the personnel committee to evaluate um, the correlation to the local market, for example, as well as the impact of a national market, which on the ministerial search process is, is uh, very significant. Um, the other piece to talk about briefly is that the, the, the UUA compensation guidelines have specific um, positions and descriptions of those positions, and some of FUSs don't fit exactly. So we continue the conversation of what makes sense from those um, to sort of mix and match, put together, talk with supervisors, talk with staff, see what makes sense. And we also know that staff positions evolve over time. So what made sense two years ago may not make sense next year. So that's an ongoing conversation. So it's a great question. And I'll jump in about the and finance committee um, role in this discussion. I know the finance committee continues to have concerns um, about the budget and sustainability. So that's a piece of this discussion. And then the, the conversation about this ethical choice uh, about a larger staff that's not compensated within UUA guidelines or a smaller staff that is, that'll, eventually um, with lots of conversation really be decided by the board and then that gives a directive to the finance committee and the leadership team in creating the budgets for the upcoming years um, you know so then that's that's where the rubber hits the road right in the budget process and then eventually um, it it's the congregation that passes the budget or changes the budget There are a few other questions uh, in the chat that I think cover, um, you know, cover the last two presentations. Um, I'll let um, Roger, Monica, and Kelly can take a look at those if you want to reply now or come back uh, come back later. There's a topic on the uh, the nursery school. There's a uh, um, I think I think Roger just uh, answered the question about the flow of information, how the committee and board and congregation are involved. Um, um, Kathy Luker's question: How does the finance and leadership team view the deficit in pledge income currently, and the desire or need for more pledge income next year? I could say that one. Out. Briefly, but jump in. Um, so this is—it's really hard to get a handle on where we are in terms of the the pledge income this year in the middle of a pandemic and economic downturn and ministerial transition. Uh, so it's there's a lot of 
factors that go into where we are. We're also midway through the fiscal year, so the, the you know these next months could unfold differently than the previous months. Uh, so there's there's a sense of a moving target on all this. What I can say is I think the the board, the finance team, the leadership team continue to monitor it to try to get a sense. Uh, uh, very hard to make predictions, but we do our best. Um, and then uh, another important piece of data will be how this stewardship drive goes that starts next month. Um, my guess is that we'll know a whole lot more about FUS's finances in June of 2022 than we're gonna know in June of 2021. That with a new ministry team, with hopefully um, an economic upturn at, coming out of the pandemic, it could be quite a different situation. That's what I'd say. I don't know if others want to add anything to that. Yeah, I appreciate. Um, I appreciate hearing this kind of long term perspective. And I know this is also, um, you know, in, in response to the um, you know, the conversation that's been ongoing for several years where, you know, um, you know, to, to make, to make these kinds of, of changes, we need, you know, we need discussion early on and to, you know, to, to face it directly that we are talking about number of staff members, um, you know, cause that's a, that's a long-term thing to, you know, to, to raise, um, the, you know, the money required to have the staffing, um, support staffing at current levels and fair wages. So, you know, so I know that there's been um, the desire for transparency. So, um, so this is it. This is a lot of detail and again, multiple opportunities to discuss, um, you know, to really look, really look long term at this. And, um, you know, and this, of course, is kind of the, uh, you know, hopefully the more difficult <laughs> time in the next several years where, um, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, in the midst of many transitions and um, and uh, a year of pandemic as well, you know, difficult in many ways. So, um, so we are. This is you know, this is a conversation that's going to take place over the next um, several fiscal years. All right. Yes. Thank you again, Tim. Um. All right. Yeah. This is bringing up the next topic. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so those of you who were on the December um, parish meeting remember that we had a, an open question um, about centering people of color. And uh, we have a on this slide, there's just a definition again of centering people of color is about shifting power, control, well-being, and comfort to people of color. Um, and so the question that we talked about in small groups was what would it look like for FUS to center people of color? And there was a lot of great discussion. Um, the board members and mem members of the racial justice team brought that discussion um, back to the board with the notes that they took. Um, and a summary of all of those small group discussions appeared in our January newsletter. We wanted to go deeper into this. Um, I think a lot of people expressed to us during that, that that they'd like to have more time to continue this discussion. Um, and, and we think it's an important one. So, so we'll continue on with the, the open question that really is meant to just provide conversation um, within the con congregation about issues that matter to them. Um, Reverend Roger facilitated a conversation uh, with the board to continue this conversation um, with these questions, and we'll put these into the chat too, and we'll be using these in breakout groups as well. Um, but I, we, we wanted to share a summary of that discussion from the board um, so that we can have kind of an open reflection of that, um, and then again, continue that conversation then in breakout groups either um, answering these questions um, as, as, as you'd like to answer them or what you see from them or reactions to um, the board discussion, any of those would be appropriate. So, um, 
So looking at these questions, the, the board had a lot of discussion that brought us back to the original idea of centering people of color. Um, and as a congregation, you know, there's there's a lot of talk about philanthropy and giving in, in these questions. Uh, we know that we do give financial resources and volunteer time to organizations led by and, and that serve people of color. But we also discussed and, and questioned a little bit whether we always trusted those organizations with our funding and our time. Um, we'll sometimes contribute to specific projects that allow us to dictate how the organizations are using our resources, whether that's money or time. And, and sometimes those efforts allow us to focus the project on our interest areas beyond anti-racism work, which, which can be a nice thing to have uh, uh, multiple issues tackled at once. We also acknowledge that this approach is not really centering people of color and, and trusting their judgment to deliver what's needed to address the effects of racism in the community as they see them. Um, we also discussed the community interviews that were conducted as part of the interim process in February 2020. While a lot of organizations in, in our area appreciated the support that we offer, there was also the opinion among community leaders that, that some of us may find it easier to give money than offer our time and talents, and um, that that may be about some of us uh, trying to give to alleviate white guilt. They, they told us that the community wants to see more involvement in the grunt work that's behind the scenes, so sweeping the floor, serving the meals, picking up trash, and even serving on boards. Um, but, but asking organizations what their highest priorities are and then listening when they say what type of support would actually help the most. In, in question number two, um, we had a lot of discussion around the words um, giving up a lot of control and um, wanted to just bring, bring that transparently uh, to the congregation. We, we wondered how people would experience that phrase. And if we were far enough along on our journey in anti-racism and anti-oppression work to recognize that, that giving up control uh, is a positive action in moving towards centering people of color. So we hope that, that folks can be vulnerable to discuss any discomfort with that phrase in small groups um, and talk through it. In our discussion, we saw giving up control as an act of shifting our focus from helping to empowering. And when we feel the need to maintain control or only participate in efforts where we see ourselves as leaders rather than follow, we even disempower people of color. So as a board, we believe that, um, kind of looking at, at question three, we believe that anti-racism, anti-oppression work is not only critical to, to our communities, um, the greater community, but it's critical to our congregation itself. Um, this work is really needed in our community at FUS. It's an important and urgent um, as uh, some people of color and their families in our own congregation have experienced race-based harm, um, often in the form of microaggressions at FUS. And we, we know that we're not living out our mission or our UU principles without focused work in this area as a congregation. The board's also energized by the great work that FUS staff and some of our congregants are taking on, a lot of it that, that Reverend Kelly mentioned. So the racial justice team, racial justice learning circle, um, the justified anger, black history for a new day course, the transforming hearts collective workshop, accepting the call to host the interfaith MLK service, co-sponsoring the talk on the history of race-based slavery in America, um, and organizing a statement from Wisconsin faith leaders that tied into the insurrection of, of it tied into the intersection of racial justice issues in the um, insurrection on January 6th. Um, so, so that's our that's our summary of kind of where where um, we felt it was important to focus and and have more discussion about these questions. Um, so at this point, I think we're going to move into breakout groups um, to discuss the questions. Um, and board members or members of the racial justice team will be there um, to listen and take notes as well. So um, we'll bring those notes again back to um, the board and the congregation. So Kelly, are you, you're organizing breakout groups? I am, I am hitting open all rooms. And, um, 
Let me also just chat the questions here so that in case you're, you lose them. Um, I think they're in already. Monica put them in already, Alyssa. Yep, you're good, Alyssa. Monica, sorry, I can't see Thank everything. <laughs> All right, yeah, will you stop sharing, Alyssa, and then we can see everybody. Thank you, okay, so. Does everybody see an invitation to go to a breakout room? I'm not sure what's happening, Jim. That's a. Monica, it looks looks like a lot of people have left. So my carefully planned <laughs> my carefully planned breakout rooms are are, are of all random sizes now. <laughs> um, Hold on, let me unmute myself so you can see how many people are in each of the groups right now. Hey, I don't know if I can. Kim, you should have uh, an invitation to go to breakout room number one. It looks like Karen's already in there. You can reroute people. Um, I don't, yeah, I'd have to move them now. Tom Belmudge's group is down to two because it looks like most of the okay. folks in his group left. And then some other groups are bigger, but I, I don't want to move them now. I think we'll. Yeah. Okay. It'll be okay. I think our biggest group is still six people. Okay. I wonder, Jim, do you want to go to a group? I'm going to ask you to unmute, Jim, and let's see if you get that noise again. Yeah. Do you know what that high pitched noise is about? Do you have two sources of audio, maybe like your computer and a telephone? And Joy and, Alan, Joy and Alan, you should have an invitation to go to room four. No, still yeah, we can't hear you, Jim. We're just hearing that high pitched noise. Um, I always do. <laughs> That's kind yeah, of also why we put it on this time. <laughs> we didn't have the questions in chat either. They don't transfer over to the small groups. No, they don't. Oh, Neither they did for us. I see people shaking their heads. Yes, that they yes. did transfer over. Yeah, we didn't All three questions them. were grouped together. So may maybe you missed seeing them. No, they, no, I looked they and chat and we didn't have any of it. So just, I don't know yeah. why that is. But it I did hear you so from other groups. It was great. I, it was great to be able to be together today. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to do more talking about this in the future. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Bye, Charlotte. Bye-bye. I think Kelly has a closing for us. I do. So this is a humorous and tender piece written by a uh, colleague of mine and Rogers. Actually, the, um, the minister who was his associate uh, when he was in Appleton and she's still there. So this is from Leah Angiri and it is called Just a Building. The automatic light flickering in the front lobby bathroom is caused by either A, a dying light bulb or B, a serial killer waiting patiently for my brief weekly visit to the office. This once vibrant place feels hollow, confused without its steady stream of whatever used to keep it humming. The finally got it right second marriages, the committee's eating pizza and hanging art, 
the staff laughing at the stress and pleasure of it all as only coworkers do. They say the people make the congregation and the building is just a building. And it is true that no squawking comes from the nursery these days. And yet in my overfull life, these quiet hallways and this big dark room with its empty chairs still constitute a place of peace. This empty building is haunted by the good and faithful people who wait patiently to file in and find name tags, who are content to worship with one another even when they don't always get along. I find my calm center all alone here every Thursday from nine to one in the quiet and peace of this place, assuming of course, a successful resolution of the bulb replacement and murder question. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining and continuing the discussion. Have a good day, everybody. Good to see you. Thank you. That's Thanks, beautiful, Terry. Kelly. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Wow. Bye.